With this presentation, we'll begin with some vast overgeneralizing. As European settlers explored, migrated to, colonized, and settled in the New World, they took their entrenched traditions of thinking across the Atlantic and continued to articulate common ideas about nature. For instance, in a colonial-era work like Mary Rowlandson's Narrative of Captivity, unassigned in this class, we see in the violent encounter between colonists and natives a deeply held suspicion for anything existing outside of the comforts of society and community. In Rowlandson's judgment of the Native Americans as heathens and hellhounds, we see that deep suspicion on display. That view of nature as hostile and indifferent to humankind, first noted in the Old Testament account of Exodus, endures into the colonial period as English settlers gradually made inroads into the American continent. However, with the passage of time and the growing consciousness of Amer the American colonies as culturally distinct from English lands and values, we see a changing notion of landscape and a growing willingness among colonial American writers to see themselves as culturally distinct from their English counterparts, a growing sense of us as New World Americans and them as the Old World. In this way, the character of early American art and literature is reconfigured to shape this growing cultural identity, and in the first generation of distinctly American writers, writing in the wake of the American Revolution, we see the growing sense that New World lands and landscapes are caused not for suspicion, but for celebration. Here is a quartet of early American writers, Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper, William Cullen Bryant, all assigned, and an unassigned figure of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who are all prone to celebrate the expansive natural world of early America. Here is also a list of landscape painters, Stanford Gifford, Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, and Alvin Fisher of the so-called Hudson River School, whose works also reflect the, that reevaluation of nature. It might be helpful to have your assigned readings, your assigned selections by Irving, Cooper, and Bryant open and available to you as you make your way through this presentation. You are linked on the content page to a short piece by the early American writer Washington Irving, a passage from the preface to his sketchbook. As you read this passage, take note of two distinct features. First, how Note how Irving describes the contrast between the American and European landscapes. Americans, America's landscape has unspoiled, untrodden, and pristine beauty, while well, Europe's bears all the marks of history. In this slide and the next, you'll also see some image from the Hudson River School of Painters, so try to see if you can note any similar aspects between Irving's written description and their artistically rendered American landscapes. The first image by Thomas Cole, pictured here, portrays a scene from James Fenimore Cooper's novel, The Last of the Mohicans. Here you should note the complex interplay of dark and light and the rich mountain scenery that dominates the work. Here are a couple more images which once again show American nature in all its power and majesty. Notice again the power of the light and the sense that something divine emanates from that light shining from off in the distance. In the image by Stanford Gifford we see the serenity of this mountain lake in upstate New York and in the picture by Alvin Fisher we see the awesome power of Niagara Falls, a feature highlighted by the smallness of the people pictured in the foreground. Again, as you look at these images, try to draw parallels between the descriptions of the American landscape found in the brief passage from Irving. In the early decades of the new American nation, the richness of that pristine landscape and of unspoiled nature stands as one of the defining characteristics that distinguish America from the well-trodden and moss-covered history of the Old World. James Fenimore Cooper's 
Leather stocking tales portray the ev evolution of the American frontier from a dangerous and forbidding backwater to one more settled and orderly across the five novels that constitute this collection. Notice the explanation on the slide that although the publication of these works proceeds out of sequence, they are organized within a narrative time frame that reflects the process of landscape transformation on the American frontier that stretches from 1740 until 1804. The events of Cooper's narrative are given unity in the perspective of the figure of his hero, Natty Bumpo, an Anglo frontiersman raised by backwoods missionaries. Natty is pictured here wearing his characteristic quasi native garb and equipped with his knife and rifle. He proves eternally more adept than his Native American antagonists at navigating the backwoods. Here's a description of an aging Natty Bumpo from the novel The Pioneers. Please pause a minute and read over this description, taking note of its most distinctive features. You might also take some time and read the two excerpts you're linked to on the content page, the first from Cooper's novel The Deerslayer, and the second from The Pioneers. In both, you'll see the authors accounting for the new nation's vast, unspoiled, and largely unsettled landscapes. Both, however, also hint at the incursions of civilization and sound notes of ominous foreboding by recognizing the costs of that process of transformation. Our last assigned writer for the week is William Cullen Bryant, a contemporary of Irving and Cooper's. On this slide you'll see some brief description of Thanatopsis, his best-known literary work. Bryant was perhaps better known for his role as editor-in-chief of the influential New York Review, a role that he served within over 50 years and one that enabled his enduring status as an influential man of letters and a shaper of American literary and cultural perspectives. Finally, in Bryant's poem, A Forest Hymn, which you're also linked to on the content page, you might note Bryant's, Bryant's habit of investing natural scenery with godly virtue after the fashion of the Old Testament Psalms. The forest, Bryant argues here, were the original churches and sites of worship, and here he gives multiple reasons for assigning them this lofty degree of virtue. Please read over the poem if you haven't done so already. Finally, to review, in the early decades of the 19th century, American writers were focused on creating a voice and a style of writing that was culturally distinctive from their old world British counterparts. Writers and painters as well did so by elevating the character of the environment and locating godly, highly spiritualized qualities within it, an early form of environmentalist thinking that endures today. The American hero was equally at home within nature and within civilization, and the natural world was no longer a howling wilderness populated by heathens, but rather a godly, unspoiled space reflecting the wonders of his creation. Thanks for listening.